What's up, YouTubes? Welcome back to my channel, Richard on Data. My name is Richard, and this is the channel where we talk about data. So I talked in my last video about statistics being one of the real core sets of skills that you need to have in order to be successful in data science. But I also understand there's a lot of you who want to go into data science who are maybe going through school right now, maybe you have an applied stats major or minor, or you're not even necessarily in stats in the first place. For instance, a lot of people go into data science from a computer science or from an engineering background. So I wanna to talk to you guys today about how much statistics you really need to know and what the most important things are to know to maximize your chances of, number one, getting a data science job in the first place, but then number two, once you had that job, actually being effective at it. So before we get into this, just a little bit about me. So I actually have a master's degree in applied statistics myself. Now, if you're asking me, do I use my degree every single day in my job? My answer would be yes, but sort of. The reason I say that is necessarily when you get a degree in statistics or in a lot of different other fields for that matter, they're really going to hone your critical thinking and your inferential reasoning skills because you're constantly solving problems that are unclear that you really have to think through and you're really flexing those muscles in your brain that are responsible for solving complex problems. So education is very helpful. As far as the actual skills that I learned during the degree, I would say there are some on the heavy theoretical side which I've never once used and there's other skills which I use almost every single day. So just as a bit of a disclaimer, I've worked in data science for about five years now, and what I'm about to discuss as what I feel are the most important things to know in statistics are based on my own personal experience. They're also based on the anecdotal experiences of colleagues and people in my network that I keep in contact with, as well as research that I've done. So in that sense, take these with a little bit of a grain of salt because your experience could certainly vary, and it definitely varies across regional lines as well. But having said that, I really do believe if you know these things, you're going to be in a really good position in the data science world. All right, so speaking broadly about statistics as it pertains to data science, you need to have good, solid, scientific foundation behind the work that you do. You also need to have tools in your arsenal for attacking various problems, and then you need to be able to explain your work and understand the things which influence the world that you're doing data science work on. So I've grouped the things that you need to know in statistics into three different categories. Number one, I've got the foundation type stuff, I've got tools, and I've got reasoning inferential type skill sets. So if we start with the foundational skills, number one I've got here is probability. So knowing probability is really gonna give some integrity behind your work, and the reason for that is all of statistics at the end of the day is based on probability theory. So I would understand things like doing probability calculations, the central limit theorem, conditional probability, Bayes rule. These are things which have wide reaching implications to a variety of different subject spaces. So understanding those things is gonna go a really long way. Next down the list, I have distributions. So I would understand things like the expected value of a distribution, or of a random variable rather, uh, the variance, also things like just generating and working with that distribution inside of a programming language, so calculating quantiles, using them to perform probability calculations, things like those. You don't have to necessarily know every single distribution, but some key ones like the normal, exponential, maybe gamma and beta, uniform, those are things you which you should probably have in your toolbox. So for the next item on the list, we have estimation. Now, often in data science, you're going to be asked to estimate some sort of quantity, but it's not going to be enough to provide just a point estimate for it you're going to need to provide some kind of interval in order to communicate what the spread or the uncertainty around that quantity is. And so when we think about something like a confidence interval, specifically, it could be any confidence level, 90%, 95%, 99%, whatever have you, you need to be able to generate that confidence interval inside of a programming language and then interpret it. So that 
say it's a 95% confidence level, what does that mean? And then that interval that you created in the first place, what exactly does that mean? And now for the final item under foundation, I've got inference. Now that to me is understanding the hypothesis testing framework from beginning to end. And now in your data science job, it's extremely unlikely that you're gonna spend all of your day conducting a bunch of t-tests or a bunch of small scale hypothesis tests. That's really not gonna happen, but that's also not really the point because the hypothesis testing framework, starting from stating what you're trying to test, then working with a p-value that's getting generated from your data and then coming up with a conclusion, that's a really helpful framework for thinking through what you can demonstrate and what you can't demonstrate through statistics and through data science. So speaking about p-values, I would thoroughly understand what that number indicates and then more honestly, more importantly, what it doesn't mean. And then also, as far as hypothesis testing is concerned, multiple comparisons rear their ugly head in data science all the time. So understanding how to tackle those problems and then things like multiple comparisons, for instance, a Bonferroni correction as an example, those are things which you should probably be equipped to work with as well. And now next up, we have the tools which you're actually gonna use to attack problems. So for a lot of instances, Linear models will actually be enough. Suppose it's some kind of classification or regression problem where you're trying to classify or predict some kind of outcome. For a lot of those problems, a linear or logistic regression type of approach will suffice. And the biggest reason for that is because a lot of people in all kinds of industries, even if they don't come from mathematical or statistical backgrounds, they intuitively understand the concepts and the meaning behind the linear models. The reason for that is because these things can be explained by pretty straightforward mathematics. They're not black boxy type approaches the way a lot of machine learning models are. And being able to interpret and understand why the model is returning the results that it is, that's going to be very important for a large number of stakeholders. So I would understand how to create these models, how to work with things like some basic model selection, backwards and forward selection, and then also, you're going to create a model inside of your programming language and it's going to return a lot of output. You need to be able to understand all of that output. So wrapped inside of that output, you have things we discussed under the fundamentals, things like a confidence interval for your slope parameters. You're conducting a hypothesis test in the background. So just understanding how all those things tie together, that's something that you're going to want to know. And next up, everybody's favorite, machine learning. Or at least that's some people's favorite. Some people hate it, some people love it. I happen to love it. Now, machine learning is gonna vary substantially depending on the job that you're working in. Some jobs may have you working in machine learning every day, some not at all. And that's really gonna depend a lot on how advanced that company's infrastructure and data science processes are. But having some of those tools in your arsenal is gonna be helpful, particularly with supervised learning or classification or regression problems, because it's pretty well known, a lot of machine learning algorithms generally are going to outperform more linear type models. Now, you don't need to be familiar with every single model in the book, but these days, things like decision trees and random forests, those terms get tossed around a lot. So those are things you should familiarize yourself with somewhat. Things like k-nearest neighbors, support vector machines, neural networks, those are some of the other really big algorithms out there these days. So certainly be able to implement them inside of a programming language. Now these days, things like scikit-learn in Python or caret in R, that makes the whole streamlined process super easy. So I would be able to work with that entire process. Now I must say as a caveat, it's really easy to get good at the actual programming of a machine learning model, but something that's really going to set you apart is knowing how you could actually improve that model. So to me that often comes back to understanding the bias and variance trade-off. 
oftentimes with a lot of different data sets, you're going to run into an overfitting problem. Now, being able to think through how to address that and make your model perform better, that is really gonna set you apart from a lot of other people. Lastly, under tools, I've included survival analysis. And my reason for that one is partly personal. That's because I've worked in the healthcare and the pharmaceutical space a lot, so survival analysis comes up all the time. So things like working with a Kaplan-Meier curve, working with a Cox proportional hazards model, basically anything involving some kind of time to event outcome or time to event endpoint, that could come up in a lot of different industries, not just in the two that I described. So that's probably going to be a good one to know as well. Moving on to our third and final category, we have reasoning, or what I like to call elements in the statistical world, which can help, to, which can help you to interpret as well as explain the space behind your analysis, the design, shortcomings, and things like that. So if we start with the first bullet item, we've got assumptions. So any single statistical model or test that you do is going to carry with it some level of conditions or assumptions. Now, you don't want to just blindly throw a test or a model at a problem. You need to know these conditions and assumptions so that you can be sure that your test or model is appropriate. Now, to take that just a little bit of a step further, there are some conditions which are going to be important sometimes, and sometimes the results of your analysis are going to be robust, even if that condition isn't necessarily met. So just as an example, suppose you're working with a two-sample t-test and you have two groups, a sample of 100 under each group. Now, one of the conditions of that test is normality. The problem is once you have a large enough sample size, you could actually simulate this and figure out that most of the time, even if you don't have normality in your two groups, because you had that large sample size, you're not gonna have any real problem from a type one error or from a power standpoint. So you can probably go ahead with that test without any problems, even though you're violating uh, that assumption. However, things like independence of your actual data points. Now, if you violate that, you're in a world of problems. So understanding some of these things is something that's going to serve you pretty well. Next up on the list, we have bias. Now, there are all kinds of different biases which can affect your analysis. Now, there are all different kinds of biases. There's response bias, there's selection bias, there's survivorship bias. There's more than I can even list off the top of my head. So I would get familiar with these because they will show up in your work and you need to understand how it could affect your results. And then lastly, we have confounding. So this is the general idea that shows up in causal or general inferential problems where X is thought to influence Y, but really there's some background variable Z that's affecting both X and Y. So if you don't know it, definitely look up Simpson's paradox, understand that concept inward and outward, because that's something that's gonna show up all the time, and knowing that is really gonna set you apart as a data scientist and as a consultant. So to understand some of these reasoning concepts a little bit better, I really do recommend a book called How Not To Be Wrong. It's by Jordan Ellenberg. It's really good at del diving really deep into some of these reasoning ideas. So it definitely talks about bias, it talks about confounding, it talks about a whole variety of other principles, and it really brings a mathematical and a statistical edge to them for the non-mathematician and the non-statistician. Link will be in the description. So in conclusion, as I'm sure you all know, the data science field varies very substantially from job to job. So as a result, the skill sets that are gonna be required are going to vary substantially as well. So that is the challenge with lists like these. As a result, the more knowledge that you have, the better. Having said that, obviously, data science is an industry where the demand for knowledge is quite high. So for that average person who wants to get into data science, 
do really well in their job, and isn't necessarily interested in developing the field in either the Silicon Valley world or publishing research. I really do believe that these skills, if you master them and get good at them, they're going to serve you incredibly well. So thanks again for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, smash the like button and hit the subscribe button. If you agree or disagree with the content, then please leave a uh, comment down below and let me know. And then I will see you in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.